Hey everybody, welcome to the Conceal Care Podcast, episode 482. We'll kick off the uh, official podcast recording momentarily, uh, but uh, yeah, it's going to be a good, good episode today, choosing the right home defense firearm for you. Uh, it's a topic that is relevant and sometimes somewhat controversial, or at least can be. I've seen some pretty heated debates about things online in various places really you don't say <laughs> heated debates on online hmm? that's a weird one <laughs> yeah hello jason thank you for joining good afternoon uh although it is still technically morning on the west coast <laughs> yeah um podcast coming at you guys a little bit you know out of the normal schedule uh today because uh, yesterday had an, another. Um, I had an interview guest planned for yesterday afternoon, and uh, unfortunately, due to some unforeseen circumstances, uh, that fell through. Um, it was a combination of that individual got stuck at work uh, longer than anticipated, and also upon arriving at home, did not have any internet service due to rolling blackouts from snow and ice storms and such so <laughs> it happens yeah. so we had to reschedule that one and uh uh matthew and i are are your your hosts today uh so yeah Good hello bobby me. eugene kenny mark joe thanks for joining everybody so um Got a good crowd with us viewing already. That's great. What do you say we kick it off, Matthew? Yeah, let's roll. All right. In three, two, one. This is the Concealed Carry Podcast, episode number 482. And welcome to the Concealed Carry Podcast, part of the ConcealedCarry.com network. I am your host, Riley Bowman. And I'm joined today by our amazing producer, <laughs> Matthew Marister. Greetings, greetings. How are you doing, man? Great, brother. Uh, glad to be doing the episode here with you. Uh, we had a little change of plans there uh, from the uh, originally planned episode with actually a different a different guest. But, uh, but things happen, and so I look forward to doing another show with my little my little bro <laughs> yeah it's cool it's cool man it's cool like uh i like to be able to jump in there you know when somebody goes down i'm right there you know what i mean <laughs> put me like, in coach like the good marine that you are <laughs> <laughs> i'm ready i'm ready <laughs> uh yeah so today's episode we've got a great topic lined up i mean we've we've covered elements of this through a number of episodes through the history of the show uh i was actually going back through some episodes and just seeing where we had talked about this but today's topic is choosing the right home defense firearm for you uh, so we're talking about how to evaluate your home defense uh plan and and kind of the the, the setup if you will of your home the factors that play into all of this and then selecting uh, it, this isn't so much to tell you, well, in some cases, we'll probably tell you what not to use, but this isn't so much to tell you what you should use because it's a, it may be different for for every everybody. Frankly, um, my plan may be different than Matthew's plan. I don't know for sure, but uh, uh, but this is about how can we evaluate the various factors and choose the best thing for ourselves. That's what this is about. Uh, going back in history on episode 272, we did an episode called Complete Home Defense, which was related to our launch of our video course, Complete Home Defense. Hard to believe that was a couple of years ago now. And, uh, oh, gee whiz, I think that was probably a little more than two years ago in the fall of uh, probably 2018. We spent... Uh, well, fall, late fall, early winter, perhaps, I guess, depending on where you live. Uh, we spent part of October, like three days, filming the complete home defense video. We really call it a video series, if you will. It's a 
in 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 DVD form. It's three DVDs because <laughs> uh, it's like eight and a half hours or something of of video content about home defense. Um, I, I've actually reviewed some of that in recent history, and and you know things things evolve and change over time. You kind of look at things that you did then, and you go, well, I might explain that or teach that a little bit differently now. But overall, it's still a really great video course. Uh, one of my favorite things in that course was doing the uh, penetration tests with all the mm. different, uh, you know, guns and rounds and things, and uh, probably bring up some of that in today's discussion as well. Um, so anyway, that kind of little little bit of a walk back in history, and 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 if you want to go back and review episode two seventy two, we talk a lot about a lot of different things relating to home defense, obviously. Today's focus, though, again, is about evaluating your home and how to choose the best or the right firearm for you to use as a defensive tool of your family in your home, wherever and whatever that may be. So uh, awesome. Uh, looking forward to it. Today's episode, surprising or not, uh, is sponsored by our Complete Home Defense video training course. <laughs> uh, so go check out concealedcarry.com forward slash CHD for complete home defense. Okay. Concealedcarry.com forward slash CHD. That's the link. And uh, you can pick up a copy. If you don't already have a copy of complete home defense, I'd recommend you do it. Now it's available both in streaming and in DVD format. Some folks may even wonder, I I'm sure we have some in our audience that are confused about why we even offer a physical DVD version. But the fact of the matter is uh, we learned a couple of years ago with another product launch that there are still people out there that desire them, even if I don't personally desire them in today's world. Uh, we, we sell a surprising amount <laughs> of physical DVDs. Uh, so they they are still apparently a thing and so we we have them made and we sell them uh but you can get the streaming version or the dvd version or actually you can get a combination of the two as well if you want to have both you can stream you can plug it into your dvd or blu-ray player uh if you have one of those as well so concealedcarry.com forward slash chd and then also today's episode sponsored by our 2021 guardian conference and the relevance here is that guys there's going to be some training curriculum presented at this conference that's going to directly apply uh, to home defense so you want to come and train with some of the world's best i mean we're talking about uh, guys like larry vickers uh, chuck haggard matt little right uh just a couple of names there that you ought to know and ought to recognize. If you want to get into the legal side of things, Andrew Branco will be there talking about legal, you know, the legal aspects of self-defense and, and also applying that, you, you know, even within the home as well. Uh, you, if you want to get some hands-on experience with hand-to-hand -hand combatives type work, uh, we've got Todd Fossey just committed to, uh, to attending and training at the uh, conference with us. So, Guys, we've got a great all-star lineup of instructors. It's going to be three days of training awesomeness. So come and join us in uh, mid, well, just just past the midpoint of September. It's I think was the seventeenth, eighteenth, and nineteenth of September, twenty twenty-one. Learn more at guardianconference.com. And again, this is the twenty twenty-one Guardian Conference presented by CCW Safe. And we need to do a better job of highlighting some of our other sponsors of this event. And EDC Belt Company is one of those sponsors. So uh, appreciate EDC Belt Company support. That's the belt of choice that I use EDC every day. Uh, I, I love the EDC Belt. Uh, the foundation belt is, is actually the, the uh, flagship product there. And they are sponsors of the 2021 Guardian Conference. And uh, we appreciate them being on board with that. So, Matthew, let's yes, uh, get into today's topic. Let's Choosing go. the right home defense firearm for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to kind of establish some context or some ground rules, if you will, and then I'm going to hand it off to you to, to, to run away with it, at least to, to <laughs> get us kicked off. But the, uh, the context is everybody's home is different. 
And by that, I mean, and keep in mind in today's episode, if you hear terms like home or residence or dwelling or f- even fa- uh, family, the word family, like all of that's going to be used pretty interchangeably. Now, legally, we should understand that laws governing the use of deadly force are almost always uh, reserved for the defense of human life, okay, preventing death or great bodily injury, okay, um, even in the case of castle doctrine law areas, that's that's really what it's about, right? Is uh, there's no duty, you know, in most states, uh, there's no duty to retreat within your home, within your dwelling. In fact, I think it's pretty much in all states. Maybe there's like one, I think it was Massachusetts or one of them's got kind of something weird and funky about that. But, um, but, but just know that today, you know, talking about home and defense of home, what we're really talking about, we're talking about protecting us and our families within our homes. So it'll be a lot of uh, words, I think, that are used uh, somewhat interchangeably, somewhat loosely in today's episode. Um, but recognize everybody's home is a little bit different, right? The home uh, layout is going to be different, right? Uh, the fact that your home is actually an apartment or a condominium, maybe it's a you know, the fact that your apartment might be single story or double story or multi-story, all that is going to be a factor, right? So your layout, uh, the type of home or residence that it is, um, the construction of your home is going to be a factor, right? Your family and the makeup of your family is a factor, okay? And, and that that's different for everybody as well. We're going to have some of you live alone. Some of you, it's just you and your significant other, your your spouse, your wife, your partner, girlfriend, whatever, uh, boyfriend, whatever. Uh, some of you, uh, you've got you and your your spouse and kids. Maybe even have your parents living with you in your home, meaning a a three generational uh, household, right? Which certainly exists. So so there's you know so the makeup of everybody's home and family is different and unique. The layout's different. Construction is different. Where that home is located is different. How, what's the proximity between me and my neighbors, right? Because I might be in a single family home, but I live in a fairly tightly laid out uh, 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 subdivision versus some of you may live more in a rural area where there's nothing around you, at least immediately. So, so all of these are factors and also, we have to take into account what what are things like our most likely threats that we might encounter and face, and what what are some of the more likely entry points for those threats into the home, right? So all of this is all of these are factors, and they all come together to inform us about our home defense plan. Right. Number one, and for first, first and foremost, we want to ensure we prevent our home being the target of a crime in the first place. We want to make it as difficult as possible, right? And that's not what this episode is. Ta- We're not here to talk about that. In fact, episode 272 of the podcast, Complete Home Defense, we talked about some of that, about the home being, you know, about making it a, a more defensible in a variety of ways, uh, making it less uh, appealing to criminals, for instance. But today it's about what's the firearm that we choose for home defense. And that's assuming that everything else does in fact fail. The criminal makes entry into our home. We now must defend our home or defend our family. Mm-hmm. And so I just laid out all these different factors. So what are we going to walk away with, Matthew? Uh, by the end of this episode... We're talking, are you choosing a handgun, a rifle, a shotgun? And even within that, there's crossover. And so what 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 caliber or round or cartridge are we choosing? For instance, I could choose a, I, sh- I could make the determination that a rifle is the right choice for me, but for whatever reason, I want it chambered in a pistol caliber. So a pistol caliber carving, as opposed to say something chambered in a rifle cartridge. Right. So 
so there, there's, yeah, quite a bit of, uh, uh, there's some crossover there, but again, we're, we're talking, what is the right firearm for me? Mm-hmm. All right. So did I lay out enough, uh, in terms of context and ground rules to kind yeah, of we can... govern our, our discussion the rest of the episode? I think we can operate within that framework. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think you, you you set it up very appropriately because I mean, a, a lot of people will say you know the mission dic- dictates the gear, right? Like, or um, so or the your your equipment. Like, what do you, what do you what's the what's the goal? And obviously, our goal is to defend our family. Um, and there's physical force protection type stuff that we do with the with the home and all that. And that's a different topic. But as far as the firearm, how do we go about picking one? Because I guarantee you, if if you know, if all the people that are listening right now were in a classroom and I said, raise your hand if somebody told you the best home defense gun is a shotgun, there would be a good portion of people who just raise their hand and never got like a real legitimate reason why it's good other than maybe you know just the sound of it racking sends people running for the hills right (laughs) or that you just point and shoot and so i think you know we have to put more thought process into what what firearm um or or what tool we're going to use and you know you ran through a whole bunch of different um factors that should should be considerations. Um, the one that you missed that that, that uh, Brianna posted here on, on the, the the blog or the the feed was um, uh, even considering the material of your home. Like, do you live in a brick home or do you live, you know, in in kind of uh, um, something with just you know vinyl siding and in some um, some dry you know uh, uh, what do you call it. You know, the, the so exterior of the home. Now, exterior of the home I, right? I did cover that when I said the construction. Ah, uh, okay. We weren't thinking. We, we weren't listening at that point. <laughs> but um, but it yeah, is a factor. absolutely. But like as you go through these, you know, you'll start thinking of things on your own, right? Like, um, is my home plan a big open type floor plan, or do I have a lot of walls? Do I have a lot of different rooms? How's my? Do I live in a ranch type home where it's spread out and I have to cover ground to get to possibly? A child's room or do I live in a town home where there's one entry and you have to come up and that's really the only entry and exit point um, so I think um, before we even start talking about like oh what's the best caliber and what size barrel and what kind of tech light do I use we have to kind of say um, obviously penetration is probably one of the big big drivers of the, the, the type of firearm we use um, another another driver is who's in the home if it's you alone you can probably select a firearm that you're comfortable with um if it's something that's going to be a universal firearm for the whole family where right like husband wife maybe you know a kid that's that's old enough to to run the gun or whatever um maybe you know you have to consider is is are they able to use a shotgun if that's your choice are they able to use a shotgun effectively um you know, do they understand, you know, how to operate uh, the pump action or is a semi-automatic shotgun better? Are they comfortable with the, with the recoil? Um, you know, those types of things. Um, so, so, you know, we, we look at kind of how the, how the uh, house is laid out. So we look at over penetration and things like that through walls and things. Um, we look at, um, the, the the platform the b- ability for it to be used universally throughout you know your family um, the access to it right um, you may not even choose to have one firearm it might be multiple firearms staged at different areas and maybe you determine a, a rifle is better in this location in my bedroom but I have a quick access safe more towards in the kitchen area so I can grab it more quickly um, you know all all these types of things but um, but there's, we should go through a checklist and start picking out these things and really thinking about it. Because if we just go, hey, I heard somebody tell me a shotgun was good, or um, I heard rifle rounds over penetrate, I'm not going to use that. You, you, you may end up steering yourself into a position where you're not, you're not utilizing the tool to the best of, for your specific layout. Is that kind of what you were thinking? Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. Um... So let's start kind of 
talking about some of these different factors mm -hmm. in a little bit more detail. In fact, let's uh, let's start with layout, and then let's move into construction or materials mm -hmm. of of the home. So let's 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 start first with layout. So um, there's obviously an infinite number of possibilities of how homes are laid out. Okay. Uh, part of my career, in fact, I have a, I have an associate's degree in architecture, uh, which was mostly a, you know, it was called, uh, it was called architectural technology. So a lot of drafting type stuff, but, but, you know, I got some crash course type, you know, level training in, uh, architecture design, uh, drawing those things up. And so I've seen a lot of different floor plans through the years, uh, design some myself. There's really though, there's, there's two, as, as it relates to my home defense strategies, there's really two approaches. There's either, there's an approach where you have all of your bedrooms more or less clustered together in the home. Okay. And then you have your other, you know, your, your, your living room, your family room, your, uh, your kitchen, your dining room, you know, those sorts of spaces are, are out, you know, they're spread out from, from that, but your rooms are essentially kind of clustered, uh, together. Uh, and then there's ones where you have quite often a master bedroom or master suite that may have some separation from the other rooms of the home. And sometimes separation may be by level or by floor too, right? So you may have, say, a master bedroom or master suite maybe on the ground level or first level, and you might have some bedrooms that are upstairs or maybe even some bedrooms that are downstairs if you have like a basement and vice versa. So there's there's obviously a lot of um, variations. But, but as it relates to my home defense strategies in particular, and what I'm getting at is um, – do I have my room where I sleep? I'm, I'm the head of my household, you know, together with my wife, we were responsible for our children and for our home. Okay. Do I have my children in there where they sleep? Okay. Keep in mind, we spend a third of our day in those rooms, at least sleeping primarily. Right. Uh, so this is a significant thing, right? And there are plenty of, home invasions that occur. In fact, a big chunk of them occur in late night or early morning hours. So, so where I sleep and where my children or the other members of my household sleep is a relevant question. So it comes down to, am I able to more or less keep everyone clustered together in a part of the house? That means that I'm more able to defend my clustered family Okay, from all from threats from other directions of the house, or do I have a situation where I'm separated from some or all of the remaining members of my house? Okay, and in some cases, for instance, if I had a master bedroom uh, that was separated from, say, the rest of my bedrooms in the house, so my kids are, are maybe all my kids are elsewhere. Well, then I might be inclined to have an approach where I, I am trying to get to where my, my kids' rooms are, and then I'm what we call the IFDR uh, uh, strategy, which is isolate the family, defend the room, okay? So, so there's the approach where I'm going to get to where my children are or my household members are and then defend from there from a defensible position. Or we have things clustered more or less together, and I'm, and I'm able to isolate the family and defend right there, or some hybrid of that right? Where maybe I have some of the bedrooms clustered, but I have one or have a child or somebody that's separated kind of more or less from the others. And I may want to try to, to make sure I can get them and isolate them with the rest of the family and then defend the family. So, um, so again, this, this is why this is relevant. The layout of the home, where the bedrooms are, where we are in relation to the other members of our household, and that starts to really come into play when we start talking about where are my most likely entries or entry points for, for threats. And then taking into account my lanes of fire, where, where firing is mo most likely to occur. And we have to think of that in a two-way street sort of, you know, 
manner, meaning that not only not only am I concerned about where I'm sending rounds and whether they over penetrate through my threat or if I miss, unfortunately, and then they travel onward. So I'm going to be thinking about where those rounds are going potentially in that direction. But I also be thinking about my defensible position as it relates to me and where I have my family members isolated and defended from and be thinking about that direction if rounds come my way. So see what I'm getting at? So we want to be thinking about layout and layout also, not only does it dictate my strategy as it relates to where I'm going to be def primarily defending my family from, but also we start taking into account lanes of fire and, and that's going to play into that, that, that could play into absolutely my weapon choice, mm -hmm. depending on the, level of precision of a shot that's required right mm -hmm. and how critical it is i ensure i mean we always want we always want to ensure we hit our threat our target but sometimes mistakes happen so we want to be thinking about risk mitigation or risk risk you know um, um being risk averse okay so if i do miss unfortunately then then where is those rounds going and that's going to maybe potentially play into that that firearm choice as well. Yeah, and I think the only way you're going to figure kind of some of this stuff out is by you actually being in your home and looking at it. Look at, you know, what 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 do I see as I look out my door? Do I see a long hallway? Um, um, you know, d assuming that that is the, the area of the house you're going to defend, right? Like, let's say this room, that this is where you're going to defend. And I look down this hallway and I say, yeah, this is a really great position for me because I have this big standoff distance. They have to come down there. It kind of channelizes them towards me. I can put a, you know, some sort of bookcase here or something that kind of uh, gives me a little bit more ballistic uh, protection a little bit, right? Um, sure. And I can shout commands. Maybe I, I say, yeah, I have access to a, a light switch uh, for the hallway right here. So it gives me a little bit of visual. So I, I'm not you know, I don't shoot my teenage kid who, who, who came home to surprise me, whatever. Um, so until you like walk your own home and kind of look at how, you know, look at those areas and you'll kind of start to feel like, okay, if somebody came in through my front door and I had to pass across, let's say your great room or your entry room or whatever it is, wow, I'm really exposed. And so maybe my strategy, if, you know, 40% of home invasions come in through the front door, Maybe I have to come up with this with a strategy that allows me to 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 move if I have to across this this space in a, in a way, and maybe I can position my furniture, put um, night lights at night, where if I can't get a, an overhead you know light on in that great room, I can still maneuver through through this quickly, where I'm not tripping over and having to get. So you know, walk your own home and 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 really think out, you know, exactly. And, and you made a really good comment about think of fire going both ways, right? Like I, I we kind of sometimes think, okay, all, all directional fire is going away from me, but think about it coming to me. If I'm crossing here, um, am I drawing fire to my family who might be in the next room over? Right. And so, um, in, in because it's so, you know, specific case by case, you're going to have to walk that, but definitely start getting into that frame of mind. Um, so you can, you, you can kind of stack the deck in your favor, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we need to have some fluff factor built into, into that. And, and by that, I mean, it, it's, a, it may be a little bit easier for us, provided our shooting skills are relatively proficient for us to look at, you know, hallways and rooms and, and their relationship or location or relation to uh, where other occupants of the home might be. And, and for us to go, okay, it's unlikely, you know, like maybe because of the angle of where I might be, where I'm likely to be positioned in this hallway as I can, like, let's just imagine, okay, this would be like worst case scenario in my mind, uh, Matthew, would be, uh, now this is not necessarily true of how, how how my home is laid out, but let's imagine that my bedroom is on one side of the mm -hmm. of the house, and I have a child in a bedroom on sort of the other side. Right. And I and in between me and that child, there is an entry door, 
which is a likely place that they may make entry. Now, criminals do come in through windows, but doors are especially a big concern because they are still the primary entry point for for even the criminals. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I've got between me and my child a door. So worst case scenario would be that door getting breached very quickly in the dead of night to where I've got to come to awake, grab whatever I need to, to defend myself, my family. And then I'm coming down the hallway or coming out of my room. And then right there across from me is my threat. And directly behind them is maybe where that bedroom is located where my child might be. Mm -hmm. Right. You see how that can be very problematic, but it may become a little less problematic if, if we know that my child's bed is positioned to the far left side relative to, to me and where my thread is. And because the layout of the hallway and stuff is, you know, we're, my point here is, I'll just try to simplify this is that it's a little bit easier for me to look at it and analyze the situation and go, well, my child is over here. My baby's in a crib. My baby can't get out of that crib by himself. So he's going to be over here, which is really out of my line, my, my lane of fire. My threat's going to be more likely from here to here based on the layout of my rooms, my hallways, whatever. Okay. So that's easier to look at and analyze and plan around. But keep in mind that the bad guy shooting at you, he doesn't care what he hits. Hmm. So errant shots are are more of a concern. And they and they can again we need to have some fluff factor. That's what I was trying to get at with that comment is that think of it in terms of rounds coming your direction as well and how you might you know, where you may be trying to isolate and protect and keep your family safe while you're taking up a position of defense to protect them. But just realize that when rounds start flying, you know, that that home invader may make his exit while he's firing blindly over his shoulder and doesn't care where those rounds go. So some some things to kind of think about and consider. Well, All right. Let me- Go ahead. Let me ask you a question kind of in context to this situation of crossing big areas of your home or transitioning through different parts of your home to get to whatever area you're going to defend. What are some pros and cons of each weapon platform when we consider a potential situation that I may have to cross through my home? What are, you know, obviously we, we covered a couple of different platforms, but what are some basic pros and cons of each one that you would say um, in that context. So precision of shot that's required, uh, really becomes a thing here, right? Um, so depending, so we have to take into account factors like what is the length, the, the max distance of a shot that I might need to take in a situation like this. Uh, for me, for instance, just as to use as a specific example, my home from my master bedroom doorway, which goes into a hallway and then all the way down that hallway into a living room and to the far side of that living room is it's about 35 feet. Is that right? Yeah. I measured it out once. It's about 35 feet. So we're talking 12 yards. Not terrible, right? But depending on the circumstances, um, that could be, I mean, that's that's not an easy shot, right? Where a precise one is required. Um, But with a handgun, I'm pretty proficient. So I'm pretty comfortable making any shot that might exist within my home with a handgun, even to a precise uh, level of accuracy. Um, a rifle might be a better choice for some people because they may be more precise and more have a greater level of confidence with a sh- placing a shot uh, where the probability or the risk of a miss is is high as far as like what the consequences might be. 
Um, so that would be that's where that would be taken into account. A shotgun, you know, with a longer distance shot becomes more problematic. Hmm. Now, at 12 yards, and the way my shotgun patterns isn't as much an issue, okay, at 12 yards with federal flight control ammo out of my particular shotgun, I'm getting like a four, five inch group. That's pretty manageable, right? But, uh, but again, here's the thing. If I miss one time with a pistol or rifle, that's one round that I miss with. If you miss with a shotgun shot, particularly if you're using buckshot or something, that's eight, you know, talking flight control, federal flight control, which is a, a recommended load for defensive use. We're talking about eight pellets that are missing. That's eight rounds that we are now, we're, we're accountable for that, missed the target and this is plausible and all those eight rounds got to go someplace they're all like 33 caliber or whatever they're significant each one of those has a capability of of, of killing somebody mm-hmm. and deflection you know can be an issue meaning that as they strike walls and construction members each one of those eight rounds can be deflected different directions potentially and that can create some problems Right. So the level of precision that's required for a shot, you know, conversely, maybe my longest distance that I might encounter in my home, maybe you live in a relatively small apartment, maybe it's 20 feet tops, maybe it's even less than that. Well, it's quite a bit closer. Right. Um, so that may change some, some factors as it relates to, well, you know, if it was further, if it's a little bit longer distance, that shotgun, you know, might be more of a concern. You know, if I got a hit on the periphery and that pattern's opened up a little bit, um, you know, that might be more of a concern versus at a, at a closer distance, less of a concern. I don't know. That That's what we're talking about here. You got to look at the layout of the home. You got to think in terms of what are my likely scenarios? Where are my people located? Where are the likely entry points of these intruders? Okay. And what are my lanes of fire? And, and that's relevant in, from a how do we mitigate risk related to where we position things and people, as well as what are the risks involved if I miss or somebody shoots at me and, right. and, and rounds come my way. And then we could start looking at things like what's the home construction like? Now, we, we know... By and large, most American homes in the interior of them is negligible in terms of there, there's there's very little benefit from interior residential construction as it relates to walls and doors and such providing protection from bullets. So we have to assume. Uh, and I would always err on the side of caution. Maybe you're in an apartment. Well, I've seen, you know, multi-story apartments that, you know, depending on how that structure is built or where you might have firewalls or whatever, you might have concrete or cinder block walls, you know, that might be part of that construction. But you don't, you, you may not be able to always know what, which walls those are or if they exist. So we always, I think we always assume that the interior walls of our dwelling house or apartment or condo we have to assume our bullets are capable of and will likely travel through those those structures those walls and doors and things and that they pose a threat to those that are beyond them so that's always uh, a consideration um but when we get to the exterior of a home matthew that that's where things maybe change a little bit mm-hmm. by that like my home is completely wrapped in brick which is frankly kind of awesome. Yeah. Um, and it's not that brick is an impenetrable, uh, you know, barrier to bullets. It's not. All right. But it does a pretty good job against a lot of common things. Mm-hmm. At the very least, we'll, we'll do a pretty, pretty fair job of significantly slowing projectiles down and, uh, making them less of a, of a threat once they've passed through, if they, if they manage to pass through. Now, um, my handgun rounds more than likely are going to 
you know, I, I, I worry less with that. Um, larger caliber rifle rounds is where it's more of a problem mm -hmm. that they're more likely to more easily penetrate that brick and, and pose a problem. A shotgun slug, probably not the best choice. If, if I'm concerned about, you know, pr protecting against uh, that projectile, you know, going through that brick. Um, shot, you know, even buckshot is probably going to be relatively well. I mean, it's going to do okay. It could, it certainly can get through, right? So anyway, so there's lots of things to take into account. But a lot of homes, frankly, I mean, think about the home you're in right now. I don't know. I haven't seen it, Matthew. Uh, I'm familiar with your older home, but mm -hmm. but I, I'm I mean, what's what's your exterior uh, siding like, for instance? Yeah, it, it's the standard. Like uh, they have plywood, and then they put up like a hardy wood or plank, you know, on the outside. Um, so it's wood. It's mm -hmm. going to go, you know, whatever I shoot is probably going to go through if uh, if it doesn't hit, you know, some sort of studs or something, you know, to to impede it or deflect it at all or take some of the ballistics away. Um, but I, I think like in general, the, the, the idea of over penetration drives a lot of people to select a firearm I, and, and rightfully so, right? Like that's probably one of the biggest concerns. And I think like we could in general without like getting into like specifics of different, um, you know, uh, ballistics, uh, getting down into, into the weeds, I can say, I, I can say in general, each, each platform, whether it's a shotgun, uh, a pistol, um, a rifle, they have uh, ammunition that would be comparable, uh, self-defense or home defense ammunition that would be comparable to one of the other platforms. Like, what I mean by that is like anything that, like if you say, well, I use a shotgun and I fill it with buckshot, right? That, so it doesn't over penetrate walls and, and harm anyone. Well, the problem with that is that if it doesn't, anything that doesn't probably penetrate drywall is not going to be that great as a self-defense round, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to like there I, I is you meant to use birdshot for your example. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, birdshot. Yeah, you said buckshot, um, right? So, so yeah. you know, so then do you go to buckshot, right? Because you know, birdshot, we know that that's not really a self-defense ammunition because it's not, it, you know, it's not, I, it's not. The, you know, the, the best, right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so what do we do? Like any, you know, you can pick frangible ammunition that is better than probably, you know, full metal jacket, um, probably, you know, better than in certain s situations, hollow point ammunition, right? So like there, there's different levels that we can mitigate our, our, um, chance of over penetration but i think we have to be honest and say any caliber or any platform that we use if we're using a, an ammunition that's effective to stop a, a human being from killing us it's it's gonna it's gonna penetrate through drywall to a certain extent so um mm -hmm. you know so then it, it gets to what can i what can i what platform gives me the best opportunity to make hits because if I don't miss, then I don't have to worry about over penetration, right? So, so I think that's yeah. kind of where my mind has gone is what gives me the best opportunity to make hit to get hits and not misses because anything that I miss with has the potential to harm if I if it goes through a drywall. So all good points. And and now penetration through building materials is a factor. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but the point you're making is that. Most stuff penetrates through houses and, and buildings well enough to be a concern regardless of what we choose. And the stuff, you're right, the stuff that is, the stuff that's recognized as not penetrating as well through typical construction materials usually is not effective enough to rely upon for stopping threats. All right, so let's let's start busting some of this stuff really quick, Matthew. Um, and I know with some people, with some with certain crowds, some of what I'm about to say will be unpopular, but it's just a fact. Okay, um, birdshot and shotguns. I'll tell you this much: it will penetrate through 
one full wall for sure. Okay. Two layers of drywall. Number eight buck sh- or bird shot. Number eight bird shot, which is one of your lighter bird shots. Uh, it will go through a full wall easily, right? Um, it'll go through typically at least three layers of drywall, and often it'll it there, you'll get a few pallets that'll go through four. Uh, even with pretty light weight number eight bird shot. All right, I've tested this. Uh, and so what does that tell us? Well, even a miss with a shotgun can, because keep in mind, like we don't want anybody that we care about to get struck by any projectile. So even a bird, even bird shot isn't good enough. Now it may keep a, that bird shot from leaving the house entirely and posing a threat to my neighbors, but don't get tricked into thinking that bird shot doesn't penetrate through like say even a single wall which i get the impression some people when they talk about it it's like ah it's gonna get stopped in the wall no big deal um it'll go it'll go through one wall for sure okay uh even the wad will get through sometimes a second layer of drywall usually not but sometimes it'll get it'll get through occasionally um bird shot against human threats not a reliable stopper not even close. It's all obviously it's distance uh, dependent. The closer you are to your target, the more effective it's going to be because you you get the cumulative mass of all those pellets, you know, helping each other out, working together, and, and they're going to penetrate better. But you get a- any distance at all. Uh, usually, shotgun wounds with birdshot are quite survivable. More often than not, I think they're survivable frankly. Okay. People might think, well, I'll shoot, I'll hit them with a bird shot and they're going to take off. Yeah, they might. They might not. Okay. Um, bird shot is for the birds. <laughs> Leave it for the birds. Okay. Use proven rounds for personal human defense. By that, we're talking if it has bird shot in the description, it's not acceptable. If it has buck shot in the district description, even though there are some that are lighter, um, chances are you're you're probably pretty good. Um, I prefer at least at least number uh, number four uh, buck shot. Okay, or number one. Excuse me, number one. Getting things backwards here in my brain. Uh, but double lot, honestly. Be, and here's the thing: your premium buckshot loads for good home defense are not usually available uh, in anything other than typically double lot. By that I mean federal flight control is where it's at. If you're using buckshot for home defense, for personal defense, you should use federal flight control. Why? Because it patterns typically the best and the tightest in virtually all shotguns. Why is that relevant? Because we want consistency. Actually, and that, I said tightest and the best. Best, I mean by that, consistency. Federal flight control patterns very consistently for shotgun round. With other buckshot, it's not uncommon to get one or two flyers. By that, it, you might have a, a pattern. You're like, oh, six-inch pattern at whatever distance. That's great. But wait, what's this other one over here 10, 10 inches away? You got a flyer. That's unacceptable to use because you can't be accountable for flyers. You are accountable, but you can't be because you can't guarantee that all those pellets are going to impact your target because you might get a flyer. Federal's uh, advent of the flight control uh, technology is a game changer. All right. In terms of how well and how consistently we can get buckshot to pattern out of a shotgun. Uh, let's talk real quick about uh, now buckshot's going to penetrate just, I mean, almost as easily as any other handgun round will. You have these 33 caliber little pellets that are, they're, 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 they're just like bullets, all right? 
You know, I just uh, got a 30 second thing to throw in there with the buckshot thing. Yep. Like lest somebody go down this road that I've seen. So my first, my first round is birdshot. Then my second round is buckshot. And then I put a slug and then I do that again, or, or some sort of combination of, you know, where it, and it, yeah, I'm going to yeah, shoot. That's, and just, that's dumb because you don't get to pick the circumstances of your fight beforehand. Right. Right. So, so, just, so, so you, <laughs> it sounds like a good idea on the surface to some people, but, and it might work for certain circumstances, but you can't guarantee that that's the situation you're going to be faced with where that solution is going to work. Right. So guys that are just, just know this guys that are in the know guys that are experienced with shotguns, guys that teach shotgun defense. This is the standard. You load one round in, in the magazine of the, of the shotgun and you have a side saddle where you may have more of the same, but you may also have something else like some slugs mm -hmm. and that you are manually it's on, it's an on the fly decision that, Oh, I have a shot that dictates the use of a more of a rifle bullet, a slug. And so you manually grab that slug out of your side saddle, you stick it in and you load that and you use it. Okay. But the idea of stack you know, of stacking rounds in a shotgun of I'm going to have one of the the first one will be this the second one will be that the third will be that you know you know first it's sand it's uh, bean bags then it's bird shot then it's buckshot then it's slug that's that's dumb I'm sorry it is okay because you don't get to choose the circumstances of your gunfight before it starts so you can't possibly prepare for every variable. And you can't guarantee that what you've pre-selected is going to be the answer or the solution. It's as simple as that. All right. So um, load it with buckshot in the magazine tube and have a side saddle with it, honestly, this is this is this is mine. Side saddle with three more buckshot, three slugs. Now Shotgun, by the way, is not my, I have one and I have it in the safe and it could be used if for some reason it became relevant, but it's far from my primary choice. Let's talk real quick about other calibers. So we're talking about penetration. All right. Let's talk about handgun rounds. This is true of pretty much, and in, 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 with that, I'm going to lump in their 22, 22 long rifle, all right? 22 long rifle. 380 auto, 38 special, 9 millimeter, 40 Smith and Wesson, 45 ACP, uh, 44 Magnum, 357 Magnum, doesn't matter. All of those handgun rounds typically penetrate quite a bit through typical household construction. Um, so much so that you really have to be thinking about where your lanes of fire are because you have to pretty much account for those rounds if you miss you have to account for those you have to assume they're going to travel through everything and leave your house and go somewhere and pose a threat to somebody else all right um weirdly enough well, now out of those i did include 22 long rifle it it will destabilize and become a little less penetrative than some of those larger heavier rounds but um Weirdly enough, contrary to what many people believe, the least penetrative round in modern times is the 223 Remington or 556 five, 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 NATO. I know that sounds counterintuitive. You have a round that's going, say, 3,000 feet per second, 55 grain or 62 grain, thereabouts, uh, 223 in caliber, obviously. And you think that thing's just going to zip right through everything. Well, that, that would be true if it could maintain a stable flight path, you know, more than likely. But the reality is 223 uh, goes, it, it destabilizes very rapidly when it hits stuff. Mm -hmm. And especially construction materials. And so what we get is very quickly that round yaws, meaning it turns sideways. And now you have a sideways pro, pro, a sideways profile of that bullet trying to go through stuff. It's going to slow down a lot faster than it does when it's going 
straight through in a stable flight path. That yawing means that, that round starts bleeding off energy much more quickly, passing through materials. Uh, so typically it penetrates a little, it penetrates less than heavier for, you know, in terms of weight, uh, cartridge or rounds uh, from things like handguns. And this is true also of larger caliber rifles. Now, the, there is a bit of a downside in that that yawing means that it takes a little bit of an unpredictable path. But experience bears what I'm telling you, uh, or, or, or experience proves essentially what I'm telling you. Okay. And by that, I mean, there was a time where SWAT teams, it was really popular to like the MP5 was like the thing for SWAT teams in, in America. Why don't you see SWAT officers using many MP5s these days? Because we've gotten smarter and they've, we've recognized that the 223 is the round of choice for urban environments where penetration is a concern. Because it, it, we get less, it, we have less issues of shoot throughs in, pe in people, innocent people getting hit by rounds when we're using that, that caliber. It just is a fact. We proved this out in my testing that I did for the complete home defense video uh, course. And keep in mind that I didn't just set up drywall stacked right up close to each other. We built walls, small walls, and had them spaced at, at realistic distances that we typically see in resident in residences. And we didn't just shoot them straight on. We did that. But I also then turned them at angles, right angles to each other, to represent what about an oblique shot, right? You're not always shooting at your bad guy in a opposite of him is a square a wall that's square or perpendicular to me it might be at an angle what happens then and what happens is pretty interesting we get a little, we get quite a bit more uh yawing and ballistic deviation in rounds like 223 we get a little bit of deviation in some of the other stuff like like nine millimeter uh and 45 but not really much at all in hanging rounds still pretty much zip right through um, 223 is, is, is really, honestly, if you're concerned about penetration in an urban environment, the 223 is your best choice. Now, finally, let me talk about frangible or rounds that are, that are advertised as being frangible and designed for not over penetrating and such. Number one, they're usually less effective in terms of actually stopping the threat. Number two, a lot of frangible rounds, especially the ones I've tested at least so far, don't respond the way you think they do in residential environments. They still go right through drywall. And a lot of times they go right through wood without any problem. They'll disintegrate when they hit brick or steel or tile to some degree. They'll still get through tile, but they'll, they start disintegrating. Um, it depends on the round, but I, I, I tested a round that oh, I've seen people recommend. I've seen people say, use the, the, um, what's it called? The Inceptor, the ARX round. It's like a polymer copper hybrid, uh, bullet that's, that's advertised as being frangible. And it, it certainly is when you shoot it on steel. Um, and it has these external flutes to have some sort of ballistic terminal effect which that's debatable as to whether that does anything or not. And I personally believe it doesn't do much. But anyway, I shot one of those Inceptor rounds, Matthew, through drywall, through a stud, a two-by-four, on, on end, meaning it went through three and a half inches of wood. It went through the drywall past that, and it then went through every other single wall. I had, I think, four of them set up. That was a frangible bullet. Mm -hmm. So not good. The point is, um, most stuff, almost pretty much everything, penetrates more than you think it does through building materials. So 
base your decision in terms of caliber on what you think is um, on what is important to you in terms of getting the threat eliminated. Okay. And, and, and now while I would love to choose a, let's just say a 308, right. In terms of like, that's going to be pretty dang effective. If I hit a bad guy in the chest with one, right. But I can also get similar ballistic results from some other things that aren't quite as recoil, you know, heavy and are probably a little bit easier to handle in a, you know, closed in residential environment. Um, so make the decision based on like your focus should be on stopping and eliminating a threat. Don't place too much emphasis on the penetration side of the equation. Okay. Let your focus be on your shooting skill and hitting what you intend to hit. Sorry, I probably went on way longer than I wanted, but on that, at least on that sec segment. No, I mean, I, I think it's, it's important because over penetration is one thing that I know if you ask 10 people, hey, why did you choose the, the home defense gun? That's nine of them. That's going to be the number one reason. I don't want it to over penetrate or I thought this wouldn't penetrate mm -hmm. as much as that. So it, it, you know, we do need to spend some time on that. Yep. But what, what about, what about um, if I were to say, ask you your opinion on using my everyday carry gun as my home defense gun, good, bad pros, cons, what would you be your, uh, your assessment on that? Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd love to hear your own thoughts on that, but I'll say this much for me. That for me, it's pretty much my, 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 my standard everyday carry gun is pretty much the gun that I would also use for home defense. Mm -hmm. Now that's easier for me to say because there's not a great deal of variance, um, between like my everyday carry gun is basically a full size gun. So whereas other people maybe what they carry daily is what we would consider to be non-optimal in terms of shooting performance, meaning that you're carrying something quite small and compact because for whatever reason you have evaluated your concealed carry paradigm and decided I need to, I need this, you know, let's say a P365. Okay. A very popular choice these days, rightfully so for a variety of reasons, but that's suboptimal, I would say, for a home defense situation. Um, unless it's the only thing you have, and as long as you're proficient with it. Now, I have a great deal of confidence in shooting a P365, and I'm pretty good with one. You've seen that. Mm -hmm. But I'm better with my more full-size P320. Mm -hmm. And that's also what I happen to carry more or less every day. So for me, that decision is really easy. It's like, so, so the gun I'm carrying right now is actually <laughs> somewhat in uh, somewhat in a state of flux because <laughs> recently, you, you know, I've been carrying like a P320 carry length slide mounted on X compact grip module, great balance of concealability as well as being shootable. But I'm, I'm, playing with some things and I'm kind of moving more towards a more, a little bit more of a full size 320. And regardless, even with my X compact sized 320, that's what I would carry throughout the day. And when I go to bed and I'm undressing for the day, it comes off the belt out of the holster, goes into my quick access safe next to my bed. And that's the first thing I'm grabbing if something you know happens in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. It's right there. It's readily available. It's quickly accessible and it's what I carry and it's what I train a lot with. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy. But again, if you're, if you're more of a P365 EDC, you, you might want to consider, you know, something a little bit, you know, manageable in terms of shooting it uh, for your home, for your home defense. If, if what you choose is a pistol mm -hmm. or a handgun for your home defense, I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, 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 I'm along the same lines as you. I mean, I, obviously, for those listening, I mean, in a perfect world, right, like money's no object, you build out the the gun of your dreams for home defense, right? Um, you know, my, my, if money was no object, you know, and it didn't cost $2,500 to make a nice, you know, 12 inch AR, 
um, that's, you know, very uh, easy to operate and, and get around corners and, and do these things, um, that would that's that that would be my choice. Right. Um, what I use, just like you, is my everyday carry gun. Um, it has a 15 round capacity. Um, and, and so for me, I, I, you know, I, the reason why is that I think that that's probably where a lot of people end up is because they carry it every day and they probably start wearing it home, uh, more often than not, or, you know, you know, when you first start, you, as soon as you get home, you take off your, your gun, you put it in the safe, but as you start getting more comfortable, you find the holster that works and the gun combination and all that, you start wearing it more and more. And, and, and it becomes part of like, okay, I'm, I'm wearing it. And now I only take it off probably at night or I'm playing with my kids or taking a shower or whatnot. Um, and so you have that around, you have it on you already. So that's, that's ideally, I mean, then you don't have to worry about where do I stage my gun? So it, it's on you. And the, the huge thing, and I kind of alluded to it before is that if you don't miss, you don't have to worry about over penetration. And I mean, I, I don't mean to make light of, you know, Oh, just don't miss. Well, that's easier said than done, but you're less likely to miss on a platform that you train with regularly. So if you have a shotgun for home defense, but you never take it out to shoot, but you shoot with your everyday carry gun, what gun do you think you're gonna be more proficient with in a, in a, in a stressful situation? Your everyday carry gun. I mean, it might not be yeah. as optimal or worked out the best for that situation, but if you don't train with that other gun, it might be the best on paper but you're not going to perform the best with it. So um, take that into consideration. What are you using? What are your family members training with? And if they're not training uh, as much as you on that platform, then it better be a platform that's pretty intuitive and pretty easy to use. And for me, I don't think shotguns are easy and intuitive to use, whether it's pump action or, or, a, you know, a semi-automatic, they're just, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not that they're difficult. It's just they're a little bit more intimidating the way you load it and unload it and safeties and all that stuff where a handgun, um, even an AR is, is really, it's almost like point and shoot type thing. I don't want to, you know, kind of mm -hmm. cliche, but um, so just think of those things. I, I think bottom line is select something that you're proficient with, that your family can use, take into consideration your surroundings um, and, and come up with a plan beforehand and just go in and, and, and make these choices based off of logic and, and education and information rather than something that, you know, you heard on, you know, somebody said and it sounded cool, you know, sh shoot rounds in the air and people run away. Well, I mean, I, maybe that works, but, you know, it's probably not your, your strat, the, the best strategy. So. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, let me throw out a couple Sort of. I mean, we need to start wrapping it up, but let me throw out a couple other uh, considerations. As we start talking about handgun versus rifle versus shotgun, um, the uh, let me let me start by addressing the shotgun question. Um, it's sort of becoming more of a old school, you know, method of for, for home defense, but I still think is very viable. Um, depending, I mean, again, this is, a, these are all personal choices and you, you got to take into account so many of the things we've talked about today and well, you know, for whatever reason, you may feel like the shotgun is the best choice for you. That's, that's great. That's fine. Um, don't choose something by the way, if you don't regularly practice or train with it. And I'd certainly recommend that you should have at least taken one good quality course with a certain weapon platform or system uh, if you're going to choose it for a critical event, like a home invasion. So, for instance, a shotgun, um, not diff not necessarily difficult to operate, but it's different for sure. Mo chances are most people have not taken a, a true like shotgun defensive course. I'll be honest, I haven't. I'm very proficient with a shotgun. I'm uh, good at shooting a shotgun. I did a lot of it in three gun. Uh, but it's definitely not my choice because it's not what I'm most trained on and proficient with. Um, it's also my... Mm, it, it's, it's, it's more cumbersome, right? Now, if, if, 
here's my personal belief. If you're going to have a long gun of any type, whether it's an AR or a shotgun for home defense, then it should absolutely have a light on it and it should have a sling. That's true of shotgun. That's true of an AR. All right. The light for properly and positively identifying your threat. The sling, because the sling is the same for a long gun as, as a holster is for a pistol. The sling gives you options, allows you to hang it in a safe manner. All right. So you can do other stuff. All right. You don't go searching through your house with your rifle or your shotgun in your armpit, right? <laughs> up in your shoulder, up on target, shining your weapon mounted light at everything as you search. Unless you absolutely know, you already know there's a threat to be to be locating, and you know there's nobody else you're going to be encountering in the process. Um, otherwise, you're searching with a light, right? A handheld light, primarily. Okay. And what what are you doing with your long gun then? It should be slung over your shoulder. Right? You can have one of your hands on it, say, and you know, this is what I'd be doing. I'd have my AR slung over me, hand my my firing hand on the grip, okay? And my other hand with the hand held up as I'm as I'm searching, as I'm doing what I need to do. Assuming that there's a need to search. Keep in mind, primarily my, my focus regarding my home and my family is everybody's already clustered in one part of the house. We we keep them all together, safe, while I have a defensible position that I wait for the threat to come to me if need be. And for that threat to get to me, he's got to go through a, a fatal funnel. Okay? So I have a very strong position advantage. I'm not going anywhere. More than likely. Okay, there are exceptions for sure. All right, so sling and a light on a long gun, shotgun or rifle, doesn't matter. It's got to be there though, in my opinion. All right, otherwise you're having to haul that thing around with you and that's not ideal. In the case of a, uh, so a shotgun again, kind of more of an outdated thing, but I think still has relevance depending on your circumstances and your needs and also your level of proficiency. But don't choose a shotgun and this is the problem and we see this, thrown out there casually so often in the firearms community. Well, I choose a shotgun because, you know, no need to aim. I've seen that comment made so many times, and that is the biggest BS comment ever. No need to aim. Just point and blast. You know, let the shot, let the, let the shot, you know, spread, take care of them. Like, that's stupid. Shotguns still need to be aimed, and you should be using a load that requires aiming anyway. Because you need to be accountable for every round, that, every pellet that leaves that shotgun barrel. Set the shotgun aside. ARs or right. Let's talk about rifles, carbines in particular, because they're they're applicable for more confined use. Um, should have a light. Should have a sling. Let's talk caliber. Two, two, three, or three hundred blackout. Probably your two most popular choices in the uh, rifle cartridges. Uh, why one or the over the other? I I don't know. You got to decide that. The 300 is going to not have the same benefits of of the tendency for that round to yaw and and start losing energy very rapidly. So the 300 is not going to be as least as less penetrative as the 223 is. Um, but it's a very it, it can be a very effective round. That's true. It's very good suppressed. If you have a suppressed AR, a 300, it's great. It's a great match for that. But a suppressed 223 is also pretty effective and is going to be also effective, you know, in terms of uh, terminal ballistics and, and the side benefit of being a little less penetrative through building materials. But what about things like a pistol caliber carbine, Matthew? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, just in general, I mean, I don't think that you uh, you gain much by using shooting a pistol caliber through a rifle. Like it, it, for me, if you want to do that, that's fine. But you, you're not, if, if you're doing it because you think it's going to penetrate less or something, that wouldn't be my reason. It wouldn't be true. Right. That, that, that wouldn't be the, the re that, that wouldn't be the logic to pick that. You may use the logic like, all right, if this, if this 
you know, uses magazines that are the same as my handgun or another firearm I, I have, and I can interchange these things. Um, maybe, you know, or maybe it's equipped somehow that, that, uh, that you can, you know, uh, put accessories on there, you can afford it, stuff like that. Those may be a little bit more, but more reasonable choices. But for me, there's just so much, so many other options that are better that picking that doesn't, unless it's all you have, or you know what I mean? Um, it doesn't, I, I don't, I wouldn't seek one out. Let, let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to agree with you. Like my, my, here's my thought process. My reasons for choosing any rifle, whether it's pistol caliber or a rifle caliber, like a 223 or something, will be based more on why I'm choosing a rifle versus why I'm choosing a particular caliber. Right. And if you have a good reason to choose a carbine or a rifle, then why are you neutering it with a less effective cartridge? Okay. So that's that's essentially my viewpoint. The pistol caliber carbine, I think they're cool. I think they can have some limited use uh, options. Everything's got to be weighed, and everybody's you know you all got to figure it out for yourself. Uh, hopefully, making you know good decisions based on you know some of the information we provided today and and and, and whatnot. But uh, I kind of think if I'm gonna if I'm gonna have that full you know carbine length platform then i'm going to have it in a in a more effective cartridge in one that has less penetrative potential mm -hmm. through buildings such as the 223 mm -hmm. just seems to make more sense to me now reasons why i might sel select a rifle say over a handgun i think one thing that maybe some people don't really consider but i think has has a lot of viability is the fact that it's a self-contained system meaning it's a grab and go. I, I could be completely naked and I just grab the rifle. I got sling. I got light. I got ammo and a lot of it. Um, don't need a holster. Don't need spare mags. Don't need, you know, like it, it's self-contained. It's grab it, sling it over you, and away I go. That's That's got advantages for sure. Um, other reasons. Obviously, there's more ballistic terminal ballistic performance out of rifles than there is handguns and handgun rounds. All right. Yeah. That's always a good thing. So that would be the other reason. Right. But otherwise it, 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 if you're not particularly, particularly if you're not well-trained, it's a less wieldy platform. Mm -hmm. Meaning if you don't have training, and this is a common thing that people throw out there is that, well, the rifles, you know, or carbine even is so much harder to navigate and, and use in a confined space, you know, going through doorways and hallways and such. That's, that's true. Although with proper technique, that's not that big of a deal. A common fallacy though, and a mistake I think people make is they choose something like a seven inch mm -hmm. two, two, three yeah. chambered AR. And again, you're just neutering the performance value of of that of that rifle. It it suddenly became a 22 long rifle. <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you're not getting the full. You're basically now shooting pistol level ballistics out of this carbine. So could have just picked a nine millimeter, you know, carbine and and, and been probably equally as well, maybe even arguably a little bit better potentially. With but a massive proven. muzzle, with a massive muzzle blast, blast. And, yes, you know, you know, gas. Uh, very, very, very loud. If you're not suppressed, pressure. Yeah, and and yes, very concussive. Um, so, you, yeah, like if I'm gonna, like it's it's well known, well documented that two 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 twenty three caliber rounds and really a lot of rifle rounds, frankly, when they get at low enough velocities, like. A seven inch 223, the one I have is like 2,200 feet per second out of the muzzle. That round loses a lot of its ballistic performance at that velocity. So, anyway, um, yeah, why do I choose a handgun? 
for my primary home defense option over, say, a rifle. This is my logic, Matthew. Um, again, for me, it is, I, I'm a handgun guy for sure. I run a mean carbine and I have taken se several, uh, numerous courses, in fact, with carbines. Uh, I've competed with them in, in three gun. I'm very proficient at shooting a carbine, very proficient at close and far distances. I've proven that. Um, I have no qualms and I have no, no comfort you know, level issue with saying, here's my, my AR, let's go use it in a defensive uh, situation. Like that's, that's a non-issue. Why a handgun though? Well, I, I live and, di and die by the handgun, frankly. It just, it is my thing. It's my jam. Like I am, I'm really good with a handgun. It's convenient. It's close by. Um, I don't currently have a real good storage solution for an AR that's quick access that allows me to have it at the ready in my bedroom. Uh, some of that is taken into account just the nature of my household, the children that I have in the household. Um, could I acquire a solution? Sure, I could. It just hasn't been that big of a priority. I feel absolutely adequately equipped with my handguns with me with the with the difficulty of shot that's required in my own home um very maneuverable and for me it's also a grab and go platform although maybe a little less so in some regards and, and by that i mean if i don't have a holster on me then i have to hold it and that's got a downside for sure now one solution is most days when i get undressed matthew you get a little tip here and it drives my wife crazy but when i get undressed for the day i drop my pants next to the bed and my holster remains attached and this has happened in the night where i have gotten up in the night because of various situations and i've grabbed my handgun i've thrown my pants on and i've stuffed the handgun in my in my holster now would that be possible in every situation no but I can do it relatively quickly. So it's going to be situationally dependent. Um, if I have the option, if I have, if, if, if I'm able to, I'm going to put my pants on and have a holster and put my gun and my handgun in a holster. It's better that way. It's safer that way. So um, that's just, you know, that's one of my, that's the way I handle it. Now there've been times too, I've gotten up and for whatever reason felt like I had the need to open my quick access safe and grab my handgun and didn't feel like I had the time to put, put pants on. You know, and those situations turned out to be nothing and, and didn't amount to much anyway. But, you know, if something was going down, okay, I was, I was ready for it. So, um, again, for me, it comes down to a good balance of ballistic performance. I know what it can do. I know what I can do with a handgun. I'm very comfortable with it. It's convenient. It's ready. It's accessible. Um, I do have the means of accessing a carving relatively close by that. I can get to if I felt like I really had a need, you know, and I've got a handgun to defend myself with in the, in, in the interim, but it's a relatively low possibility as I see it. So I don't know. That's my choice. That's my logic behind it. Um, final words from you and kind of like what's some of your, your, I guess your own logic as you, in your own choice, I suppose. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. Um, currently, you know, like I said, I, I use my everyday carry gun. I also have, you know, quick access safes in other areas of the house just so I can access because we have a basement, a second floor and a first floor. So I want to, you know, ha have access wherever I am. I typically carry inside the home anyways, but um, you never know. And, you know, I'm not always home. So sometimes my wife is here by herself and um, she doesn't carry every day, you know, on her person inside the home. So, um, that's a consideration I made. And, and I, I think, um, handgun, um, we train, uh, routinely with a handgun. And so, um, in a perfect world, I'd have, you know, a couple ARs here. Um, but, uh, but, you know, in, in reality, your your life is going to dictate what what you can train with and and your specific layout of your home and everything so do you know i guess in in everything just make educated decisions on what you do just don't follow the herd or follow you know some some um something that doesn't seem to make sense or that you don't put thought into and say well i'll just do it because somebody else told me to do it um anything i say you know 
research it online and debunk it or whatever. Don't just take what I say, you know, at face value anyways, but um, this is my opinion. And, uh, but make, make good decisions because, you know, what, what, what everybody, uh, uh, somebody else says do this and it doesn't work for you. They're not, you're not going to go over to there and say, Hey, you know, you told me to use a shotgun and it didn't work. And now my family said they're, they're not, a, a, you know, held accountable for that. So they're not giving you uh, advice for that. So make sure you make your just your choice based off of uh, educated um, information and, 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 and what works best for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Yeah. Those are good, good final thoughts. So as we wrap it up, uh, I guess a quick summary would be consider your home, its layout, the construction of that home, where your people are within that home. Uh, what you may have to do to get to or defend or protect those people, right? Where your lanes of fire may be, all right? Both ways, two-way street, right? Rounds going, rounds coming, potentially. Put put that all into context. Look at your home, lay it out, and, and analyze it in that way. Think about where you want your family members to be located for max safety, considering all those lanes of fire and whatnot. Consider some elements within the home that may offer some protection. We haven't touched on this in this episode today, but we do touch in the Complete Home Defense course as well as in the Complete Home Defense episode in uh, episode 272. And by that, I mean, there are things like one of, one of the more effective, and you alluded to it earlier, one of the more effective ballistic stopping pieces of furniture or whatever in the home is a bookcase that's fully like stocked with books. It uh, usually presents a lot of material, paper for for things to go through to to uh, get to you. Um, it's it's at least an option. It's not a guarantee. Just like any, there's nothing in a home that's really a guarantee, pretty much. Um, but positioning things like a bookcase or other types of furniture uh, may you know it, it all factors in. Okay. Um, we have a situation in our home where we have a large, heavy, very well constructed uh, armoire that is strategically placed that offers at least some additional protection to incoming threats and where it's related to, you know, where it is located wise, uh, location wise, related to uh, 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 occupants of our home. Um, things like, uh, uh, your, your appliances, your refrigerator, your stove, that kind of thing. They usually offer a little in the way of ballistic protection, to be honestly honest with you. Um, but they can offer some, so, it, you know, it, 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 it's, it doesn't hurt and we should use things where we can in terms of cover because at the very least concealment is better than nothing, but give all these things consideration. Think about where your people are where are you going to position those people where, where you can and uh, where are you going to take up positions of defense where you have advantage. Advantage is key because keep in mind the, the intruder has the advantage by initiating the attack. Uh, we need to take that initiative back by taking, you know, having advantage based on our, our tactics and our position. Um, Considering all that, considering ballistics, ballistic performance, right? And consider, most importantly, how you perform the best and what you perform the best with. Super, super important. And Matthew, you hit on that very, very well. The most important thing in these situations is that if I have to use deadly force, if I have to fire shots, then I hit what I intend to hit. And I need to have the skill level to back that up with whatever weapon choice it is that, that we, that I go with. I need to have the skill to get the hits that I need to get. And I need to be absolutely accountable for those hits. That's the thing that truly matters. And so to make decisions based off of fallacies, like I'll use this because it doesn't penetrate very much through walls and such is is actually negating the the more important factor 
of hitting your threat and stopping them immediately. So I've enjoyed this conversation today, Matthew. Me too. Me too. Um, I, I suspect that we've given some food for thought for many of you out there watching or, or listening to this. Um, went a little bit longer than I intended, but, but felt like we, you know, did it, did the, did, I think we did the topic some justice. And that is important. Sure. Sure. Guys, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Uh, we need to announce our weekly podcast prize winner uh, before we let you go. Every week we do the podcast prize uh, or, or giveaway. Uh, you can participate by going to concealedcarry.com forward slash podcast prize is the link. Uh, fill that form out each week. Participate, share, get more or extra entries into that giveaway. Increase your chances of winning. And what are we giving away today, Matthew? We are giving away a $50 gift card to SSP Eyewear. Awesome. Yep, 50 bucks. $50. That's straight up like $50 cash to go yeah. buy some some iPro. Oh, so yeah. that's that's great. Uh, and then what are we giving away next week? It's a palm pepper spray. First time we've done that one. So that'll be cool. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. So we'll send some send some pepper spray to uh, to one lucky winner next week. Uh, Maybe restricted based on location. By the way, uh, like for instance, I don't think we can ship it to New York. But um, but guys, make sure you participate. Sign up concealcarry.com forward slash podcast prize. Today's winner, Matthew. Please drum roll. The winner today is Brian. Brian, I have sent you an email. Uh, check your spam and everything if you have the name Brian. Um, and uh, make sure you get back to us within 72 hours, and we'll get you that code for your SSP eyewear. Gift Congratulations, card. Brian. Yeah. With that, guys, we we need to wrap it up and get out of here. Remember, check out the complete home defense video training on concealcarry.com, concealcarry.com forward slash CHD. And also... Make sure you sign up and come to our 2021 Guardian Conference presented by CCW Safe, because uh, there's going to be some fantastic training there over three days, much of which will be applicable to some of the things we discussed today. Sign up at guardianconference.com. So with that, a reminder to train right, train often, and train safe so you can fight hard, fight fast, and fight true. Take care.